I'm grateful that we have the opportunity to explore and look at what is a beautiful and beautiful, powerful book written from a man in prison. As I think about what we've been assigned to look at today, beware of the philosophies that deny Jesus, I can't help but think of some experiences from my past. I remember when my girls were small, this uh, television series known as The Veggie Tales, where you learn life lessons from a bunch of fruits and vegetables, I think mostly vegetables. And I remember there was an episode about pirates who don't do anything. Some years later, I remember my oldest daughter, Katie, and I going to see a movie called Pirates Band of Misfits. And I didn't expect much, but it actually was a little better than I thought it would be. I, I enjoyed it, but don't tell her so. But it was one of those clay animation movies about these pirates, these lovable pirates, and even one of them is actually a fish dressed up to look like a pirate. And they have this dodo bird that they think is a parrot, and they're lovable, and they're laughable, and they're lots of fun. I think about the children I saw in my neighborhood, whether it was when I was a child or later when I had children of my own who would walk from house to house and they would knock on doors in their cute pirate costumes. I think of the Pirates of the Caribbean series, which was popularized and put forth by the Disney Corporation. And people of all ages have flocked to theaters to watch, who have streamed it, have purchased the DVDs. Pirates have become safe. And in that, maybe is an illustration and a lesson that we can learn and use to connect to what we see in Colossians chapter 2, verses 6 through 10. The approach I have to Colossians is it's about the fact that the Savior is sufficient and supreme. I use chapter 2, verses 9 and 10 as my theme verses. Some would use chapter 2, verse 7. Others would use other verses to kind of sum up what they see in the book. At the heart of the book, it's about Jesus. And the first half of the book focuses on the Christ, who He is and what He's done for us. And that's really what the lesson last night and the lesson this morning has been about. It's been about what's happening in chapter 2. Who is Jesus and what has He done for us? And so what's going to happen in chapter 3 is you're going to have this transition to, okay, because of who He is and what He's done for us, how should we live? But in between moving from Christ to the Christian, there is this warning for the Christian not to be led away from Christ. And that's what we've been assigned to focus on. And what you're going to find as we receive this warning in chapter 2, there are two facets of that. You have philosophy and religion that become intermingled. And the reality is in, in much of society in both modern and ancient world, it is often difficult to separate philosophy from religion. They are both worldviews. And so there is a great deal of overlap often our philosophies and religions become intermingled. As we talk about what's going on in Colossians 2, 6 through 10, Paul is going to use two illustrations. And Paul uses lots of illustrations in his letters. In fact, often he'll have a few core principles, and then much of the rest of the book is illustration and application of those few core principles. And so he is going to use two types of illustrations in this section. He's going to use illustrations from the plant world, and then he's going to use an illustration from the pirate world. As he talks about being rooted and being robbed, and then what we need to remember. The biblical bullseye I want you to hang on to, and somebody says, hey, what did you guys talk about in the middle lesson on Saturday morning? I want you to say we focused on Colossians chapter 2, verses 6 through 10, and beware of pirates. Colossians 2, 6 through 10, and beware of pirates. With that is mine. Let's dive into the text. He says, therefore... As you have received Christ Jesus the Lord. Remember I talked about yesterday, Christ is 25 times in the book. Jesus six times in the book. Lord 12 times in the book. This tremendous emphasis in sentence after sentence on Jesus Christ. 
Now, I want us to note the word therefore. Anytime you see the word therefore, you need to think about what the therefore is there for. You know, we have signpost words. Just like when I'm driving uh, up the, down the road or I'm coming up from Alabama up here to Indiana, there are road signs that guide me and give me directions. It's the same thing in the biblical text. Words like that, since, because, for, so that, in order that, therefore. Those are all words directing our brains. It's telling us how what we're about to talk about relates to what we've just been talking about. And so what he's about to say is not only based on that statement, therefore, as you have received Christ, but it is in essence a summary of everything he's been saying from chapter 1 up through chapter 2 and verse 5 where he has stressed that Jesus is king and image of God and redeemer, the peacemaker, that he has forgiven us, that he has reconciled us to God. In chapter 2 and verse 3, it says, All the treasuries of wisdom and knowledge, and that's really important against the background of philosophy. He says, All the treasuries of wisdom and knowledge reside in him. So He is our King, He is the image of God, He is the Creator, He is our Redeemer, and He is the one who is the source of all wisdom and knowledge. And so then in verse 4 He's going to talk about His concern that they would be deceived or defrauded, that they would be led away from the one who is King, image, Redeemer, etc., and so what he's doing is saying, therefore, as, as people who have received that Jesus, there are some things that should flow out of that. I think it is very valuable here to look at what's going on in the language. Because as you look at the verbs that are used in this little section, Paul uses three different types of verbs that are very helpful to us. He uses aorist tense words that in this context they don't have to always refer to an event in the past, but in this context they do. But simply a statement that something happened, a snapshot if you will, like a, a picture that you would hold up or have on your phone that, that just shows an event that happened. Twice he's going to have aorist words here. He says, this is in whom... Well, let me get forward to the next slide. He says that we have been, uh, have received Christ and have been instructed in Christ. So he says, received, there is tense, and instructed in Christ. Now remember chapter 1 verse 7 tells us they were instructed by Epaphras. And so when he says you have received Christ, he is talking about the moment of their conversion. Snapshot, moment in the past when they were receivers, they, they express themselves in repentance, confession, and baptism. They express their faith and received Christ Jesus. As Paul would put it in Galatians chapter 4, baptism exercised through faith, they put on Christ. It, actually, Galatians chapter 3, verses 26 and 27. So he's talking about the moment they received Jesus. And he says, you have received Jesus and you have been instructed in Jesus in the past. He's already alluded to that chapter 1, likely the instruction they received from Epaphras, one of their own who had preached to them. But then he says, having received Jesus and, and instructed in Jesus, you've also been rooted in Jesus. And that's where we have that plant illustration. Now the word for rooted here is a perfect tense verb. It generally has the idea of something that occurred in the past that has some kind of impact on the present. That's really important because remember, what's the backdrop of this whole section? His fear that they will be defrauded. His fear that they will be taken captive. And so he says, you've not only received Jesus, you've not only been instructed in Jesus, but you've been rooted in Jesus, and that being rooted in Jesus isn't a past tense thing. It continues. You were rooted in Jesus, but your roots are still in the ground. What he's saying is, don't let someone pull you up by the roots. 
Now, I remember when I was a kid, we had a half-acre garden. We lived in a subdivision, but my dad, even though he was a, an engineer, used to work for NASA, he never got the farm out of his blood. And so in our subdivision, we had a half-acre uh, garden plot out back. So in the summer and you know throughout the summer there was the list. I don't know if any of you had the list on the refrigerator. The only thing that kept me going to the refrigerator is because there was food there and I think that's why dad knew that was a good place to put my list. And so there would be this list of things you needed to do. And it often involved doing something in the garden. Now the only part of the garden that I enjoyed was the part where you picked the fruit and ate it, or picked the vegetables and ate them, or dug up the vegetables and ate them. So my point is, he would say, do, and often involved weeds. Now, you could go about weeds a couple of ways. I could take my hole and I could just whack it off above the ground. But you, what's going to happen next week? That weed's coming back and it's going to be on list again. And so dad used to say, you've got to make sure that you get up the roots. And that usually meant you couldn't use your hole because if you go that deep, you're then messing with the plant that you don't want to uproot. So it usually meant bending over, reaching down, grabbing it, and pulling it up by the roots. So what he's saying here is you are rooted in Christ Jesus. He then, having said you were rooted and you continue to be rooted, he then transitions to present tense words. When he says, walk in him, be built up in him, be established in him, those are all present tense words. He says you were rooted in Jesus, and because you were rooted in Jesus, you need to be walking, i.e. living like Jesus, living a life that is consistent with the life Jesus lived. You need to be growing, being built up. You need to be maturing and growing stronger. And you need to be more, we need to be more firmly established. Think of the idea of I'm rooted, but I'm letting my roots extend deeper and deeper and deeper into the soil. The deeper the roots go, the greater the likelihood that the plant will not be uprooted, the tree will not fall. The past for Christians must always influence the present. And unfortunately, what we have done is we have viewed both the, the same place as the starting line and the finish line. There was a time in my life before my doctor said my knee doesn't work anymore and told me to quit that I used to run a lot. And you can tell it's been a while since I've run. But I can remember when you would run races, sometimes the race would start and finish at the same place. Sometimes it would start and finish at a different place. I remember a race when I was in college that I lost a spot because I thought the starting line was the finish line and then the finish line was actually about 50 yards beyond it. So I sprinted with all I had, passed this guy up, stopped at what I thought was the finish line and he went by me and I'm sure was laughing to himself the whole way. Here's my point. As Christians, we've made the starting line the finish line. We've made the point of our conversion, the moment when we are baptized into Christ for the forgiveness of our sins, a lot of us have made that the finish line. Okay, I've done what I wanted. Well, I want you to go back to what Adam was talking about in chapter 1. You see, what Jesus is after, I often, often have said and told a lot of my students, Jesus doesn't want our salvation. He wants our sanctification. And salvation is just the starting line for that journey. In other words, when I am baptized and go from being lost to being saved, that is not where Jesus wants me to arrive. Because remember, what is chapter 1? That He might present. His goal is to be able to present us whole and blameless. His goal that we would be like Him. As Paul says in 2 Corinthians 3.18, we are being transformed into His image from glory unto glory. What He wants to do is to present us to the Father and to Himself in heaven as looking and living like Him. So becoming a Christian is not the end of that process. It is the first step in that process where I enter into relationship with Him so that I might spend a lifetime becoming like Him. That's what Paul's saying. You're rooted in Jesus. But that's not the finish line. You, we need to walk in Jesus. We need to be deeper in Jesus. Let the roots go deeper and let us become stronger. 
Why, Paul? Because there are people who want to pull us up by the roots. There are people who want to dislodge us from Jesus. There are philosophies and religions that can threaten our confidence in our relationship in and with Jesus Christ. And so he says, see to it. Because we're rooted and should be deeper in our establishment, every day going deeper and deeper in Jesus, he says, see to it that no one takes you captive. You see, he had a plant illustration. You are rooted in Jesus, so walk accordingly, live accordingly, grow accordingly. But make sure no one takes you captive. And when he says, don't let anyone take you captive, he moved from a plant illustration and analogy to a pirating one. Because the word he uses here is the word that they would have used in the first century for kidnapping someone or the looting of a ship. Don't let anybody kidnap you. Don't let anybody loot your spiritual vessel. Don't let spiritual pirates have your faith. So whether you want the planning analogy or the pirate analogy, the point is don't let anyone become a threat to what you're rooting in. Don't let anyone become a threat to the riches we have in Christ. Remember what he said in chapter 2 verse 3. All the riches of wisdom and knowledge are in Jesus. So don't let some pirate loot your ship. Don't let some pirate have what we have in Jesus. Dr. Schreiner is one of those who has spent a great deal of time in his lifetime studying the life of Paul. And while I have times I disagree with his findings, it is interesting to look at his research and what he sees concerning the life of Paul. And in a book he wrote on the life of Paul and the theology of Paul, it's about that thick. He talks about the fact that there have been many attempts to figure out who the false teachers are in the book of Colossians and what we would call the Colossian heresy. That's a word we use. It's not a word that they would have used back then. And he talked about the fact that from his research and the research he noted from others, they could find at least 44 different guesses as to what this false teaching was and what it was a combination of. We're just touching the hem of the garment. And there you've got some kind of mixture of Judaism, you've got a mixture of paganism, you've got a mixture of philosophy, you've got worship of angels or spiritual beings beyond this realm, at least a, a, an added emphasis on them. You've got asceticism, all of these things that are mixed together. And so what he's saying is these things, whatever this false teaching was, and even as we try this weekend to help think about what some of those might be, at the end of the day, we don't know absolutely and definitively. We have a, an educated guess or two. We can get in the ballpark. And so we'll talk about what some of those things might be in a few moments. But I don't want us to get so caught up in knowing exactly what it was he was dealing with that we miss the fact that his point is, don't let anything pull you from Jesus. Whatever it is, in whatever time, in whatever place, don't let anything rob us of Jesus Christ and what we have in Jesus Christ. So he talks in verse 8 about philosophy, empty deception, traditions of men, elementary principles of this world. And all of those things are intermixed and intermingled. There are a number of guesses about what this might be referring to. I'm going to take a few moments and talk about a line of thought that had been around for a long time prior to the first century. It is not crystallized until the second and third century A.D., but it existed long before that. It had uh, roots in Asian philosophy in the region of Iran. It had roots in Jewish myths and philosophies. It had roots in Greek thought. There was a mismatch or mixmatch group uh, 
known in the second century as the Gnostics. It comes from a Greek word that means knowledge, and you have forms of that word all through the New Testament, who claim to have a unique and special knowledge, and that wholeness, spirituality, lay not in the physical realm, but it lay in enlightenment. It lay in the spiritual. It lay in the mind, and having an enlightenment and an understanding that others did not have. It's intermixed with a lot of different backgrounds. And again, it has not fully crystallized by the writing of this letter somewhere between 60 and 62. But it's important to recognize that, first of all, even when you had Gnosticism in existence, none of the groups were exactly alike. And the writings have differences. But there are some common threads that you can see running through them. But we need to recognize that the thought lines, the philosophies behind it, had been around a long time. And so different people were pulling from different threads in that carpet. There was this belief in, in general that the material world was evil. It was the world of the mind that was truly spiritual. It was the world of the metaphysical. It was not this materialistic realm that we should focus on in life. The material world is evil. And so if you decide that the created world is evil, then all kinds of thoughts flow out of that. And so there, this was kind of the philosophy that impacted a lot of other philosophies. You see, for most of us, there's, there's one thing we believe or don't believe in that colors everything else. I used to have a friend who said, you know, well, nothing determines who you are so much as your view of God. How you understand God, and for example, what it means for Him to be sovereign, what does it mean for God to be sovereign? Whatever you mean by that will determine most all other beliefs you have. So I back that up to say that if in the ancient world, especially in some forms of Greek thought, you believe that this physical material world is evil, then it will co color all of the decisions you make in your life. Whether it's just philosophies about how you live every day or whether it's your religious beliefs in the spiritual realm and, uh, realm and your eternal destiny. And so some of these other things flow out of this original thought line. The physical world is evil. So if you have a world that is physical, then you can't have a holy, righteous, and good God making an evil world. So therefore, again, I'm moving into the second century, further removed than from Paul. The idea would be that the God of the Bible, the God presented in the Old Testament that made the world, can't be the God. Because you can't have a holy, righteous, and good God making an evil place. So you end up with this spiritual realm where you have many variations. You have the ultimate God, but then you have Him surrounded, that being surrounded by other beings that are in varying levels of spirituality, varying levels of divinity. And so the God of the Bible who made the world is several times removed, if you will, from the real God. That God is distinct and separate and has nothing to do with this world. And so you end up with this dualistic view of the God, of the Godhead, or, or what you think of as God. And the God of the Bible is a lesser God, a more detached God, not the one true real God. Why? Because you, if you believe the world is evil, then they would view it as inconsistent to have an evil place made by a good God. It also impacts the view of the Savior. In Gnostic thought, again, I'm moving into the second century, they would take the position that the Savior is not somebody who saves you from your sins. He is the one who enlightens you, who helps you to understand how things really are, that takes you beyond the God that is described in Scripture to the true understanding of that realm, that principalities and powers realm, the elementary, elementary principles of the world realm that lies beyond. And so it's all about the Savior is the one who enlightens you. It impacts how they view sin. 
There were some out of this line of thought, matter is evil and thought, spiritual realm is good, that came to the view of asceticism. And so this idea that if matter is evil, then you do everything you can, sept can to separate yourself from the physical and all the pleasures that are associated with it and focus more on the mind. You had then also that existed in the ancient world growing out of this general philosophy, immorality. Okay, so one side says, okay, if the world is evil, avoid it and avoid any of its pleasures. The other side says, well, if there's a separation from the mental spiritual world and the physical world, they're not really connected. So what I do in my physical self doesn't impact my spiritual self. So my, my sins don't impact me. So those are two extremes that ultimately go back to the belief that the world itself and created physical matter is evil. So as you think about those two extremes, you can think about those two existing in our world. It also presents a problem if you've got people, again, Gnosticism in its form is not here yet when Paul writes this letter. But we do know there were people when Paul wrote this letter who believed the world was evil. So if you believe the world is evil, and you've got somebody who comes along and starts talking about the divine son, the logos, as John calls him in John chapter 1, becoming a physical human being, you've got a clash of philosophies. That religion clashes with their philosophy. You can't have a divine being becoming a human being if you believe that the physical form and forms are evil. So you've got to figure out what you're going to do with it. Well, later on, what the Gnostics would do with this is they would have the possession view that Jesus of Nazareth was just a man who was possessed by this spiritual essence. And so he was possessed at his baptism, i.e. spirit comes on him in the form of a dove. And then just prior to his crucifixion, that spiritual essence departs him, and it was not the divine essence on that cross. It was just the physical man, Jesus, who was possessed for a time by this other self, this spiritual existence. The other view is the docetic view, which literally comes from a Greek word which means to seem, dokeo. And so the idea is he just seemed to be real. He just seemed to be physical, but he wasn't actually physical. Now let me emphasize the one in the Bible who is most likely, most directly dealing with some of this in more of an organized form is John. This thought oozes out of the Gospel of John and 1st and 2nd and 3rd John. Now we also need to recognize those letters were written 30 to 35 years after Paul wrote this particular letter. All I want you to realize is, even though some of this is crystallized more in the second century, it flows out of thought that pre-existed. It flows out of thinking in the Greek culture and other cultures that was around long before Jesus came. And at least gives us some insights into what are some of the elements that might be feeding into this false teaching. So you look at this list, philosophy, traditions of men, elementary principles of the world. Much of what I've just described, especially coming out of Greek thought and Asian thought, and even to some degree uh, the myths of Judaism, you can see in that discussion. As we think about our world today, I mean, there are many who could elaborate on this. I think if Ralph Gilmore, my friend, were here, he could go all over the world on modern philosophies, okay? I don't have a, a degree in philosophy like Kippy Myers or Ralph Gilmore. But as I look at the world around me, I see things here that also impact our view of Jesus. You know, there are a lot of philosophies from the ancient world that are still here. If you go to Acts chapter 17, you're going to find Paul interacting with the Epicureans and the Stoics. The Epicureans were basically ancient evolutionists. Okay? They believed in a form of evolution. If you want to know what Stoic thought looks like in popular culture, then watch Star Wars. Okay? Pantheism is behind the concept of the Force. Now, don't misunderstand me. I'm a big Star Wars fan. I'm just not a big pantheism fan. 
and I'm not a big Stoic fan. But I want us to recognize in that illustration that there are first century philosophies that Paul had to deal with that are a part of popular American and world culture today. And I just want you to think about some very simple things in our culture. Maybe simple is an overstatement. I want you to think about things like naturalism, consumerism. I want you to think about relativism. We have this belief in certain aspects of our world that there has to be a natural scientific explanation for everything. And so when we look at any given situation, when we look at the existence of humanity itself, when we wrestle with the big questions, why are we here and what are our purpose, the answer always has to come from the natural world. And so when a person opens Scripture and he goes to Colossians 1 and it talks about Jesus as the one who created when we go through the Gospels and we have reference to Jesus performing miracles that go beyond the natural realm, that mind is going to be shut off to Jesus because they can't fathom a world that has an explanation that goes beyond the natural. I was reminded as I was flipping through channels, maybe it's late last night, that if you go to the History Channel, you have one of their most popular shows is a show called Ancient Aliens, where you have this constant search for where is there evidence that there are aliens. And one of the interesting things that has come up in the last 20 years or so in my lifetime is then this fascination of as we try to wrestle with where did we come from, there is an, an increasing openness to the idea that aliens played some role in how we got here and became what we are. All I want to say with that is it's fascinating to me in this drive to, there has to be something physical, even if it's out there in space, that explains how we got here. And so it drives us in a direction and shuts down an openness to the concept of Christ as Creator, Christ as miracle worker. Consumerism is all about being consumed with what I can get in life, and life is about what I can get. And so worship becomes about me, and everything becomes about me. And so when it's about me, then I'm going to struggle with accepting the teachings of Jesus who talks about sacrifice, who washes the feet of the man who's going to deny him and the man who's going to betray him, and then says, I've set this example for you to do as I have done. You see, when we have this view that it's about me, we're going to really struggle with the teaching of Jesus, and it becomes a barrier between us and Jesus. A growing problem, and it's been around for a long, long time, is this idea of relative truth. That we struggle to believe that there could be any kind of truth, or if there is truth, could we ever know it and recognize it? That's going to present real problems when Jesus says, Continue in my words, and you shall know the truth and the truth shall set you free. Or when Paul is going to describe in Ephesians chapter 4 spiritual maturity as speaking the truth in love. And it's going to become a barrier between us and Jesus. There can't be an absolute truth. There can't be just one God. There can't be just one Savior. So I want you to think about that statement or that quote last night from Charles Templeton, who at one point in his life uh, claimed to believe in Jesus and even talked to people about Jesus, who then says, how can with all the religions in the world we believe that Jesus is the only way to be saved? That's the direct opposite of Acts chapter 4, verses 10 through 12. And so when we, we look at the world through these views, it is going to inhibit our understanding of Jesus and our openness to Jesus and our willingness to listen to and learn from Jesus. And what I think is really important, and really the, the stress in my area is beware and understand how Satan works. What we find is most of these philosophies are hidden behind something that looks fairly safe. It may be hidden behind scientific thought. It may be hidden behind tolerance. It may be hidden by the, behind the idea that human beings have needs to survive. And all of those are good things. I'm not anti-science. Science has blessed our world. I view science as just the discovery of what God built into the planet. So I don't think science is a bad thing. I think it's like a lot of things. Sometimes good things get misused. 
But what happens with some philosophies is it will be hidden behind what is in and of itself a, a good or wholesome or at least a valid concept. Should we be tolerant? Yes. But there's a radical difference between being tolerant and going to an extreme of relativism where there is no truth and Jesus cannot contain that truth. It is one thing to say that science is a valid thing and that we should test our hypotheses and look for evidence, etc., and look for what God built into the world. That is very different to going to the other extreme to say that there can be no power beyond the physical world, that there can be nothing that can't be put in a test tube. And so that which is dangerous is often hidden behind that which in and of itself may be fine and good. And so what he says to them is don't be looted. Don't be kidnapped by philosophy, by that which originates with the human being instead of that which is according to Christ. What comes from Christ, consistent with Christ, the one who has all the treasures of knowledge. And he says, in Him, Christ, the fullness of deity dwells. In Him you have been made complete. And in the word fullness and complete, you have two different terms that have a related root that connect to a philosophy that we have the first evidence of in the second century, tying into the Greek word pleroma, which basically just means fullness. And so it's generally used in writings throughout the first century, even into the second century, with just the idea of fullness or being made full or complete. It can refer to a nation that is full or complete and filled with people. It can be, it's used in a lot of different contexts by ancient writers. But you have a guy named Valentinus in the second century who begins to use it in a different sense. He began to use it in the sense of referring to that spiritual realm and Gnostic thought where you have the ultimate being and then all these levels of beings below that ultimate being who are intermediaries between the human being and the ultimate being. And so it came to refer to that realm, that fullness, and that was the pursuit of every life, of enlightenment and understanding, so that ultimately we might be a part of that realm. One of the questions that comes up when you're looking at verses 9 and 10 is the question is, is Paul talking about that concept? Maybe. It definitely, what Paul says in Colossians 2, 10, 9 and 10, would definitely be a counter to that thought that he is not one of those intermediaries. He's not some kind of lesser intermediary, but the reality is he is actually equal to the God, the Father, who is the Creator. So it, it certainly would be a great argument. The problem is the guy who is the first one to originate the idea, and really it's not solely his, but it's pretty much him and his disciples. Not all of those of Gnostic thought believe this. But the guy who originated is not born until 40 years after Paul writes this letter. He dies about 100 years after Paul writes this letter. So the thought might have been flowing around, but it's, there's no evidence that it's crystallized at this point. And so while it would be a great argument for what is said 80 years later, there's a real possibility that what Paul is just trying to say is we are filled up and completed by Jesus and therefore we don't need anything else. See, often I describe this false teaching that it was in Colossae, we call the Colossian heresy, as and one Christianity. You familiar with the and one sports line? You've seen t-shirts with and one and uh, basketball shoes with and one. I call it an and one Christianity. It said you need Jesus and something else to truly be spiritual. You need Jesus and philosophy. You need Jesus and Judaism and the law of Moses. Jesus and, Jesus and. And so what Paul is saying is get rid of the and one. It's just Jesus. He says, first of all, Jesus is God. In Him all the fullness of deity, present tense, is dwelling. That's what he says. He is dwelling in Him. And it's reminded as we look at the divinity of Jesus, it's clear that the Son of God is equal to the Father. John 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and without Him was nothing made that was made. Jesus, the Word, the Logos, 
is equal to God the Father. That is undeniable. Now we need to remember Jesus was the name He wore when He became a human being. You go to Luke 1 and Matthew 1, when the announcement was made to Mary that Jesus was going to be born, it says, You shall call His name Jesus, for He will save His people from their sins. He was given that name when He became a the, the eternal Logos, that's the word John uses for him when he says, in the beginning was the Word. He says, in the beginning was the Logos. That's, that's how John described him in his pre-human form. But when he became a human being and was born of Mary and laid in an animal's feeding trough in Bethlehem, the angel said, you call him Yahweh saves, or salvation is of Yahweh. That's what his name means. His name was a statement of his life purpose. Every time you said Jesus' name, you said, here's why he's here. He says, you shall call him Yahweh saves, for he will save his people from their sins. I found it interesting when last night Brother Rick was talking about Isaiah chapter 6 and how he saw the Lord high and exalted. In John chapter 12, John is going to refer to that. And John, in John chapter 12, I just want to read for you what John says. Verse 37, And though He had performed so many signs among them, yet they were not believing in Him. This was to fulfill the word of Isaiah the prophet, which he spoke, Lord, who has believed our report? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For this reason they could not believe, for Isaiah said again, He has blinded their eyes, He has hardened their hearts, so they would not see with their eyes and perceive with their heart, and be converted, and I heal them. And then listen to verse 41. Now he is quoting from Isaiah. And then he's going to say, here's why Isaiah said that. These things Isaiah said because he saw his glory. Now whose glory did he see? In the context of John 12, he's talking about Jesus. In Isaiah 6, when he said, I saw the Lord high and exalted, who did he see? It looks like from John 12, he saw the pre-incarnate Jesus Christ. He saw His glory and spoke of Him. Yet in spite of that, nevertheless, many even of the rulers believed in Him, but because of the Pharisees were not confessing Him, for it was there that they would be put out of the synagogue, for they loved the approval of men rather than the approval of God. Does that sound like Colossians? He says, don't listen to philosophies that originate with human beings. Jesus is the divine equal to God. He also became a human being. 1 John 1, 14, He took on human flesh. Philippians 2, He emptied Himself. Luke chapter 2, verse 52, He increased in wisdom and knowledge. Now as you think about that, would you ever say of a divine being that they need to increase in wisdom? The Logos, the Son of God, you wouldn't say increased in wisdom. But when He became a human being, He increased in wisdom. Because there was some sense in which He emptied Himself. So when He came into the world, when He was 37 seconds old, He knew what every other 37 second old human being knew. And had to go through a process of what? Increasing in wisdom and rediscovering who he really was. But in spite of that, despite of the fact he fully became a human being, he never stopped being God. In John chapter 9 verse 38, the blind man whom he has healed bowed down and worshipped him and Jesus did not stop him. If he is not God, that is sin. And then in John chapter 20, on the lips of the guy that we have labeled the doubter, is one of the most direct and powerful statements of the Lordship and divinity of Jesus anywhere in the Bible. Thomas said, My Lord and my God. You see, there would be those who would question the divinity of Jesus because of the humanity of Jesus. Yes, He became human being. But the fullness of what it means to be divine is dwelling 
in Him. And because He is the fullness of what it means to be divine, then He, without any other teaching, He and what He teaches and what His apostles teach, are able to complete us, to help us to become whole and mature, to become sanctified like Him, to be like the Father, to become what God wants us to be as embodied in chapter 1 that Adam talked about just a few moments ago. And so he says the fullness is in Him. All the riches of wisdom are in Him. He is fully God. He can fully complete us. So what he's saying is, I know you've got these Johnny-come-latelys who are saying we've got good news or gospel 2.0. Let us just add to what you heard from Paul, a little of this, a little of this, a little of this, and then you'll truly be spiritual. He says, if you've got the one who's fully God and you've got the one who fully completes you, why would you go somewhere else? If you have everything you need right here, why would you think the grass is greener on the other side when all the grass is on this side? There is no grass on the other side. It's just Jesus. Don't let the pirates rob you. He says, you're rooted in Jesus. There are people whose philosophies will rob us of the treasures we have in Jesus. And so we need to be reminded of who He is. He is God, and He is the one who completes us, and we need not look anywhere else. As you think about the pirates of the Caribbean, our pirates' band of misfits, our veggie tales, pirates who don't know anything, Or you think about the kids wearing their costumes on Halloween. Pirates look safe. Oh, maybe like Jack Sparrow, a tad mischievous. But at the end of the day, they're the hero. They'll make you laugh, and you'll have a happy ending. But if you were ever on the high seas, and you saw this, Would you be thinking of pirates who don't do anything? Would you be thinking of the clay animation? Would you be thinking of Jack Sparrow? Or would you be fearing for your life? Because the Hollywood picture of pirates doesn't match the real deal. And how Satan works is he takes that which is dangerous... And he makes it look loving. He makes it look intelligent. He makes it look like tolerance and acceptance. He makes it look safe. But at the end of the day, if it's contrary to Jesus, and it's someone else that's not Jesus, they're pirates. Beware of pirates. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for loving us. We thank you for your Son. Just help us to treasure who he is and what we have in him. Help us to have the courage to not let anyone rob us of that great blessing. In your Son's name we pray. Amen.